The Lord be with you. Good to see everybody here this morning on this fourth Sunday of Easter, otherwise known as Good Shepherd Sunday. And uh, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is our Good Shepherd. And kind of the tie in there is the present tense Jesus is our Good Shepherd. It wasn't like he was, but in Easter we celebrate the resurrection, so he is alive, forever shall be our Good Shepherd. So we get to celebrate that with a lot of Good Shepherd songs this morning. And of course, we have the sacrament, so all this is definitely worth celebrating today. And to emphasize that present tense gift of our Good Shepherd, our first hymn is the King of Love, My Shepherd Is. Please rise as we sing our opening hymn. God bless your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The psalmist reminds us, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. With this knowledge, then, we may confess our sins before God, and with one another with confidence. Merciful God, we go about our days failing to proclaim your saving power with our voices or with our actions. We do not live as one saved, but rather as people filled with fear and doubt. We often choose what is expedient, not what is right. We close our eyes and ears to those who are in need and close our hearts to those we claim to love. Quick to hurt others and slow to right our wrongs. Friends, the Bible teaches that God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, our good shepherd who laid down his life for us, his sheep, we are forgiven. 
Please be seated for our hymn of praise. Please rise for prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. May be seated for the readings. Good morning. Our first reading on this fourth Sunday of Easter comes to us from fourth chapter of Acts, beginning at verse number one. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson can be found in 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse number 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has a world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. 
By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord.
that's wonderful. That was an old day. I remember that song from way back. Not as old as some of our hymns, but very nicely done. Thank you, choir. Please arise in honor of our Lord Jesus for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. The figure of speech Jesus used with him, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and they have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated for our hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Judith Fain was a student at the University of Durham in England a number of years ago. Now, as part of her doctrinal studies, she'd spend several months of each year in Israel. One day, while walking on a road near the old city of Bethlehem, Judith watched as three local shepherds converged, each with their own separate flock of sheep. The three men hailed each other and appeared to be good acquaintances, if not friends. They stopped to talk for a while. And while they were conversing, their sheep all intermingled, melting into one big giant flock. Judith looked on, wondering how the three shepherds would ever be able to identify their own flock after all that intermingling of indistinguishable sheep. Judith kept watching until the men were ready to say their goodbyes. Okay, this is going to be interesting. What a mess, she thought to herself. Like a huge traffic jam with, with nothing but white Toyotas. She watched, fascinated, as each of the shepherds began to call out to his sheep. And at the sound of their shepherd's voice, like magic, she thought, the sheep separated themselves again into the three separate flocks, just like that. Apparently, she smiled to herself, some things in Israel haven't changed for thousands of years. That's a, adapted from Anne Spangler's book, Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus, which came out in 2018. Well, presumably, this observ observant doctrinal student, Judith, when she said that some things haven't changed, she was alluding to the wondrous words of our Savior, who, like a shepherd, leads us, as we just sang. How does Jesus lead us? Well, this becomes a very important question this morning. Like the modern-day shepherds that she watched in Bethlehem, Jesus in our gospel lesson today from John chapter 10 says something similar concerning his flock from verse 16. They will listen to my voice. The voice of the shepherd, through his word, he will call, gather, feed, protect. In short, he will cause to flourish his flock, for he is the good shepherd. And that's how Jesus starts out our gospel reading this morning. He first identifies himself as, I am the good shepherd. And he is the good shepherd. So already important distinctions are being made. If he, Jesus, is the good shepherd from whom is he setting himself apart? Now, you could be forgiven if your first thought is to say he's setting himself apart from the bad shepherds, good shepherds, bad shepherds. And that may be true to a certain degree, but that's not exactly how Jesus phrases it. In verse 12, Jesus says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So here Jesus calls these would-be bad shepherds hired hands. Their heart is not in it. There is no devotion or bond there between a hired hand and the flock, as indicated by his readiness to run at the very first sign of trouble. He's certainly not going to face down a threatening wolf, is he? It's more like, here's my staff, Mr. Wolf. Let it be your own toothpick after all you can eat. I'm out. Well, the wolf, in the language of the parables, can mean serious danger or trouble from outside the flock. And here our minds, or at least my own, first goes, perhaps to hostile and oppressive governments, be they communist or maybe Islamic, for example, where following Jesus even today in the 21st century could be met with the death penalty. Brother and sister Christians in such lands need our 
earnest prayers for safety and for strength to endure against such outside hostile forces. But St. Paul, extending this metaphor of sheep and wolves, in his parting word to the Ephesian elders, Paul charges them, quote, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Then Paul adds, even from your own number will arise uh, men and those who distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Paul's language here evokes the pictures of wolves in sheep clothing rising up from within them. Paul's farewell leaves a certain power vacuum right there in Ephesus. And in my own observations, it's when a church is left without a pastor, when it becomes shepherdless, even if it's just temporarily, that's when it is the most vulnerable. I've seen congregations come to ruin when from their own number arise men who are bent on power and self-ambition. This is fertile soil as well for false teachers to lead you astray from the grace and the peace that we have in the all-sufficient Christ. And as you look around the landscape of churches in America, you can see so-called leaders, supposed shepherds, who are fleecing the flock. They promise material blessings for big donors, and they oppress you with the fear of a vengeful, vengeful God that is one who is absent forgiveness and mercy. These are the guilty shepherds of Israel against whom the prophet Ezekiel railed in his prophetic utterances found in Ezekiel chapter 34. These so-called shepherds of Israel were guilty, guilty of treating the flock entrusted to them like the hired hands that Jesus spoke about. They were only using and abusing the flock, devouring them, it says there, for their own selfish gain. They, the shepherds of Israel, the opportunistic hired hands, these are the ones who should fear a vengeful God themselves. For through his prophet Ezekiel, the Lord declares, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will come, make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. And the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Furthermore, God also makes promises regarding those sheep who are out of line, saying this, I will rescue my flock they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken." Unquote. Well, please keep in mind here something very interesting that Ezekiel is prophesying in the 6th century B.C. He's part of the exiles in Babylon. And all this is some four or five hundred years after King David lived and died. So then the question becomes, who is this servant David that Ezekiel prophesies about? The one who shall come and feed God's flock. Feed them and be their shepherd? Well, that's the pressing prophetic question then, isn't it? Who is both servant shepherd, a Davidic king, and then at the same time one who can claim to be God himself who will come and seek the lost, as God so explicitly declared he would do through Ezekiel's prophetic word? Well, it's exactly here that our gospel lesson today plays out like a the theatrical script of this foretold drama. You have Jesus who starts out declaring himself to be 
the good shepherd, which is to say he is the God shepherd. That leap from good to God is not as big as you might think. This Jesus, the son of David, says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Unlike the shepherds of Israel, unlike the hired hands, the good shepherd takes on all threats, all the enemies of the flock from within and from without. He never abandons the sheep, but gives his all. And who is it that gives his all? Well, think back to what the Apostle Paul was quoted as saying earlier to those forewarned Ephesian elders. Paul said, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Acts 20.28. Who is it that showed himself to the world as God incarnate? Is it not the son of David, Jesus, the son of God in the flesh, who shed his blood to buy your redemption from all sin, death, and the devil, that is, our age-old enemies from within and from without? Yes, it is this Jesus, God's Messiah, the anointed one, who bought your forgiveness and my forgiveness and the forgiveness for the whole world with that very same body, that very same blood that he offers you freely here today in the blessed sacrament, sacrament of the altar that he himself ordained to be both a memorial and a distribution center of his true joyous gift, body and blood, forgiveness of sins. Don't miss out on them for ignoring his words For as he himself said, my words are spirit. They are life. His word conveys abundant life, eternal life. Well, back here in John 10, our gospel reading, these hired hands, out of their stubborn unbelief, miss the gifts, but they don't miss the message. Now, by that, I mean they too can see, or hear, rather, that Jesus indeed is claiming to be God, the good shepherd. For later on in chapter 10, as their dialogue escalates, the Jewish leaders want to kill Jesus right then and there. Verse 31 says, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. So you see, they got the message loud and clear that Jesus was claiming to be that servant of God, God himself, God the Son, the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Well, if so, then Jesus is indeed the good shepherd, then these leaders of Israel who want to kill him are the hired hands, right in line with their abusive ancestors, the self-serving shepherds of Israel that Ezekiel prophesied about. For proof of this, just take a brief look at the context of our gospel lesson today, and it's sufficiently proven. This whole dialogue in John chapter 10 starts because Jesus' disciples in John chapter 9 behold a blind beggar on whom Jesus has compassion. Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. The Jewish rulers, of course, interpreted this good deed as bad law keeping on the day of rest and proceeded to try and rest for the joy from this blind man who was celebrating his sight said the Jewish rulers to the healed blind man, whom they were interrogating now. Give God the glory. We know that this man who healed you is a sinner. To which the formerly blind man replied, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The Jewish Jewish rulers answered him, you were born in sin, and would you teach us? Then verse 34 says, and they cast him out. Witness the hired hands in action, right there. These contemporary shepherds of Israel could not devour this particular sheep, so instead they cast him out. The very same soul 
on whom Jesus, the good shepherd, had earlier taken compassion and bound up his visual wounds of this poor sheep who had been stricken by his misfortune since birth. This was the storied blind man on whom Jesus had stuck mud in your eye, his eye and instructed him to then go wash it at the nearby pool of Siloam. So under these circumstances, this happy recipient of God's blessings never actually saw Jesus, his healer, up to this point anyway. He had only the voice to go by in order to recognize him. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus said. This healed blind man eventually did see his Savior, Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Our lot in this life, however, is to go on hearing the gentle voice of Jesus, our Good Shepherd, until we are at our life's end, all the while trusting in his word, the Holy Scriptures, and looking to his holy sacraments, which combine with his powerful word. His word is living and active, His gospel has power to forgive sins and to resurrect life. Jesus, our good shepherd, reminds us today that he not only lays down his life for the sheep, but he also has authority to take it up again. Our God is good and all-powerful. Jesus is both our good shepherd and when it's time for our faith to become sight, as Peter reminds us, Jesus is our shepherd and guardian of our souls to carry us safely to our eternal home with him. Amen. And now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep equip you with every good thing to do his will, working in you what is pleasing before him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, many of the blessings of the Lord are articulated right here in the creeds of the church, these ancient creeds. Today we get to articulate our faith and those gifts in the words of the Nicene Creed. Please rise for that on page 10. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being at one steps in with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship with the offering.
Please rise for the offertory. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Shepherd of Israel, in your son Jesus Christ, you have sought out your sheep and gathered us into your flock. Keep us always in your fold and guard us from every wolf and snare. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you alone gather us as your sheep and send faithful shepherds to us. In your good, good timing, Lord, in accordance with your gracious will, Send us and all those congregations in need faithful under-shepherds to do your will. Raise up devoted workers that your flock the world over might be fed and well cared for. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son has called us to love our brothers. Turn us in love then toward the neighbors closest to us, especially with the time change coming up shortly in our worship hour. Grant us patience and a spirit of cheerful assistance where there might be need or hardship with others. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, through the Paschal Lamb, you have wrought peace between man and God. By your gift of good government, grant peace and good days also to our citizens as we approach elections here in the U.S. But we pray also for peace between the nations of the world, that we and all our neighbors may lead quiet lives in godly contentment. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, by the first fruits of Christ's life from the dead, you secured forgiveness for our troubled consciences. Bless also with temporal health and well-being those who suffer among us, especially those whom we name silently in our heart even now. Dear Lord, grant them aid in this moment, and even more so, true immortal health in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our shepherd, you calm all fears in this valley of the shadow of death, and you prepare the holy table of your son's testament for us in the presence of our enemies. Grant us repentant and faithful hearts, and every tribulation or besetting sin lead us to find comfort and strength in your overflowing mercy, given to us here in this sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, out of your fatherly goodness, you have remembered us poor, miserable sinners and given your beloved Son to be our shepherd, not only to nourish us by his word, but also to defend us from sin, death, and the devil. Grant us your Holy Spirit that even as this shepherd knows us and helps in every affliction, we may also know him, trust him, seek him, and comfort in him only and heartily obey his voice and obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. And by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, 
Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise for the post communion canticle. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now you get the full blessing. I had a partial blessing at the end of the sermon. But this is the full blessing from the book of Hebrews. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you now and forevermore. Please be seated for our closing hymn.
Amen. You guys really sung that one out strong. Good for you guys. Well, today's a special day, and I'm alluding to this insert in your bulletin because Otto and Sons Nursery are going to host a little afternoon tea starting at 1 o'clock. And Scott, you promised the sun's going to be shining up there, right? (laughs) We hope you can make it. Uh, I went to the last one. Just a lot of fun. You just get to look at the pretty flowers, snack, and talk. What what could be better for a Sunday afternoon, right? And while I'm pointing to the flyer, I'll talk now about not an afternoon, but Saturday morning, next Saturday morning, out there in Santa Rosa at the regional park. We'll do a little three-mile loop hike, and it's flat. So if you haven't gotten into the spring hiking yet, it's a good starter. So I hope you can make that. Um, We had a good crew last time we did that a couple years ago, I believe it was. But Saturday at 9 o'clock, meet you out there. Uh, Blaine, you got something. I think probably everyone knows by now, but I just want to make sure that they do, that starting May 5th, we're going to one service at 10 o'clock. So that was kind of the results of the poll was slightly in favor of that. So that's what we're going to. And also to update on the call process, not too much to report at this point. Um, The district is working on vetting some people and giving us some names, but we haven't really gotten too much success at this point. So if anyone knows of anyone, that any pastors, feel free to pass their name on to me and I will uh, pass that on to the district. Yeah, wonderful, thanks. Yeah, the, the elders are all eager, they're excited, but we're just not getting much to work with. Uh, Diana. On Saturday, May 11th, we're going to have a potluck, and we're having the potluck. It's going to be a casserole salad potluck, but Pastor Nelson and his wife and two sons are going to be here, and he's going to be able to tell us about his mission work in the past two years. So if you're available, I'm going to encourage everybody to please attend. It's going to be probably right around 1130. Thank you. Great. And he's, I think, headquarters in Indonesia, but he travels to those places, kind of alluded to in the sermon, where you can get in real trouble if they find out, one, you're a Christian, or two, especially if you're sharing your Christian faith, you get in real trouble that way. Uh, Any other announcements? Now, here it's okay to share your Christian faith, so I hope you do that this weekend with one another. God bless. Have a great week.